The Valley of Tears is the name given to an area in the Golan Heights after it became the site of a major battle in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, known as the Valley of Tears Battle, which was fought from 6 October to the 9th of October. Although massively outnumbered, the Israeli forces managed to hold their positions and on the fourth day of the battle the Syrians withdrew, just as the Israeli defenses were almost at the point of collapse. Chapter 1 Background On Yom Kippur Eve, the Israeli 7th Brigade was ordered to move one battalion to the Golan Heights to strengthen the Barak Armored Brigade, under the command of Yitzhak ben Shoham. The brigade commander Avigda ben Gal concluded that something would happen on Yom Kippur. He ordered his artillery troops to survey the area and prepare targets and firing tables. He held a meeting with his battalion commanders to go over the main points of the operational plans that were previously implemented in the Israeli Northern Command. Without notifying his superiors, he took them on a tour of the front line. By 12 o'clock on Yom Kippur, the 6th of October, the brigade was concentrated in the Nafak area. Nafak was an important military base at the junction of the Petroleum Road, which crosses diagonally the northern Golan Heights, and a road which leads down to the strategic Blot Yaakov Bridge over the Jordan River and into northern Israel. Israeli intelligence estimated that Syria had more than 900 tanks and 140 batteries of artillery immediately behind the Syrian line. The Syrian 7th Division was one of the units ready to attack. The actual number of Syrian tanks was about 1,260. Each Syrian infantry division had one infantry brigade, one mechanized infantry brigade, and one armored brigade. The infantry and mechanized infantry brigades each had three infantry battalions, a battalion of 40 tanks, an anti-aircraft artillery battalion, and a field artillery battalion. The armored brigade had three battalions of 40 tanks each. The division also had a regiment of division field artillery, a divisional AA field artillery regiment, a reconnaissance regiment with a company attached to each brigade and a chemical company with a section attached to each brigade. The total force of the division was about 10,000 men, 200 tanks, 72 artillery pieces and 72 anti-aircraft guns and surface-to-air missiles. The 7th Division, under the command of Brigadier General Omar Abrash, had about 80% of its tanks and armored personnel carriers. There were also independent armored brigades with about 2,000 men and 120 tanks each. One of the independent brigades attached to Abrash's division was a Moroccan brigade. In the rear were the 1st and 3rd armored divisions, with 250 tanks each. The Syrian attack force was backed by at least 1,000 artillery pieces. The Syrian plan was for the 7th Division to break through near Ahmadiyya in the north while the 5th Division did the same near Rafid in the south. This would lead to the double envelopment of most of the Israeli forces in the Golan. Each division was to advance in two echelons, the 7th Division to strike westward through El Rom and Wasit while the 5th Division advanced to the Arik Bridge north of the Kinneret. If the 5th Division broke through, or if both the 5th and 7th did, the 1st Division would drive between the 5th and 9th for Nafak to attack the Israeli forces caught between the pincers of the 5th and 7th. The Israeli forces in the Golan were 170 tanks and 60 artillery pieces divided between the 7th and the Barak Brigades. Chapter 2 Prelude At 10 o'clock on Yom Kippur, Ben Gal and other brigade commanders convened with General Yitzhak Hofi in Nafak, where Hofi told them that intelligence was estimating the Syrians would attack that day, at around 1800 hours. The 7th Brigade was assigned as a reserve force around Nafak and was to prepare for a counter-attack in either the north or south sector, or to split and support both. Ben Gal then drove to meet one battalion in Sindiana and address the officers. He called an orders group at Nafuk for 1400 hours, assuming it would give his 2nd Battalion enough time to organize. As they gathered to wait for him, the Syrian artillery and planes began to attack. Bengal's men ran back to their battalions while Ben Gal moved the headquarters out of the camp. After an hour, 
he was ordered to move to the northern sector in the Cunetra area and to transfer the 2nd Battalion to the southern sector, under command of the Barak Brigade. The 7th Brigade was left in charge of the northern sector from Cunetra northwards with two battalions. As part of his usual strategy, Ben Gal decided to maintain a reserve force and began building a 3rd Battalion. He transferred a company from one battalion and placed it under the command of his armored infantry battalion, thus creating a third battalion framework with tanks. With reinforcements, the new battalion gradually became a proper one, Ben Gal now had three battalions available for maneuvering purposes. He received Lieutenant Colonel Yernafshi's 74th Battalion, which was in the line with the fortifications in the northern sector. With Nafshi's battalion, the brigade had about 100 tanks. The 1st Battalion was stationed on the Purple Line. The line began at the fortification A1, directly east of Macedon the foothills of Mount Hermon, and ran south about 6 kilometers to Mount Hermonit. Chapter 3, Battle. Chapter 3 Section 1, First Day. At 1355, while Nafshi's sector came under a heavy artillery barrage, Several soldiers along the Purple Line reported that the Syrians were removing the camouflage nets from their tanks and artillery. Ben Shoham ordered his battalion commanders, Nafshi and Odederes, to deploy their nearly 70 centurion tanks in prepared battle positions. Nafshi was at Cunetra when the order came to deploy his platoons and move his headquarters somewhere safer. He immediately ordered his troops to leave the town and the tanks to advance while the soft vehicles fell back. Erez's 53rd Battalion was moved, to the southern Golan. One of Nafshi's platoons of three tanks was near the Wasid crossroads when Syrian jets attacked Tel Abu Nida. When the jets departed, the crews began moving to the bunker line. After one kilometer, they came under large caliber artillery fire. Before 1400 hours, Nafshi reported to his brigade headquarters that his battalion was ready for combat and was manning the booster ridge. The Syrian 85th Infantry Brigade assault column reached the Israeli anti tank ditch before its officers noticed that the engineers were not in the vanguard. They decided to dismount tank crewmen and mechanized infantrymen and rush them on foot to improvise crossings. This halted the attack in full Israeli view and exposed the men to Israeli fire. Nafshi ordered his men to destroy the bridging tanks. During the afternoon the Israelis destroyed most of the Syrian bridging tanks within sight, putting them out of action with shots fired at a range of 1.8 kilometers. Only two of the bridging tanks managed to reach the anti-tank ditch north of A3. The Syrians threw two bridges and a company of ten tanks crossed the ditch. The Israeli air force was called into action, but many planes were shot down. The first close combat commenced in the 74th Battalion's northernmost sector, against the Moroccan Brigade of 30 tanks. One Israeli centurion was hit, and an Israeli platoon that was sent northward to guard the Dan Road was caught between the Moroccans moving against Tel Sheita, and a Syrian battalion closing in from the west. Avner Landor's company, now with seven centurions, was also threatened and could not help. Nafshi delegated the area north of Hermonit to his deputy, Major Yosef Nassim, and reinforced the sector with Captain Yal Shaham's company, leaving a company from the Armour School Tank Battalion as a tactical reserve. In 40 minutes, every Barak Brigade Centurion in the northern Golan was committed. Nassim ordered Shaham to reinforce the trapped platoon around Tel Sheita, and ordered his deputy, Lieutenant Asaf Seller, to cover the area south of Tel Sheita, which could provide easy access to her monnet, with one platoon. The Moroccans continued to fire at Tel Sheita, but did not advance, and the Syrian battalion was stopped when its leading vehicles were destroyed on the roadway. The Syrian battalion commander decided to move southward and try to penetrate between the Dan Road and her monnet. He was unaware that he was moving between the forces of Shaham and Sela, who prepared a trap. They opened fire just before 1500 hours, using superior positions. After a little more than two hours, the Syrians withdrew, leaving behind their bridging tanks, a bulldozer tank, two BRDMs and six main battle tanks. 
Shaham's company lost two centurions. Just before nightfall, Shaham noticed three Su-100 gun carriers and a truck close to Nassim's position, from which Nassim could not engage them. Shaham directed Sela, who could not see the Syrians, to intercept them. Sela, accompanied by one other centurion, opened fire at the rear of the Syrian force and destroyed them at a range of 200 to 300 meters. Two Syrian tanks attempted to cross the open ground to the anti-tank ditch in the unguarded area south of Nassim's sector. The Syrian companies began moving toward that area, hoping to cross just before nightfall. As darkness fell, Nafshi ordered one company to move forward towards the Syrian bridges across the ditch to destroy the tanks that had crossed. The Syrian company that crossed was hit by Landor's tanks and destroyed after half an hour. The bridgehead was sealed. In late afternoon, Hofi decided that the Barak Brigade's 65 tanks could not contain the Syrian attack alone, and committed the 7th Brigade's 105 centurions. Believing that the northern sector was more crucial than the southern sector because of the Cunetra Gap, he ordered Ben Gal to assume command of the area from Bunker 107 northward. The Barak Brigade was now put in charge of the southern sector already occupied by Erez's 53rd Battalion. The 74th Battalion was transferred to the 7th Brigade, while the newly arrived 82nd Battalion, under the command of Captain Mayor Tiger Zamir, and two companies from the newly arrived 75th Armored Infantry Battalion from the 7th Brigade, to the Barak Brigade. Avigda Kahalani's 77th Battalion, which was familiar with the terrain after having worked there for a week, was returned to the 7th Brigade. Ben Gal decided to create a personal reserve by attaching one company of the 82nd Battalion to the 7th Brigade's headquarters. After an hour, the 82nd Battalion was transferred to the Barak Brigade. By nighttime, Nafshi was placed under the command of the 7th Brigade. The Syrians kept advancing in columns, using colored lights and flags to distinguish units. Some of them struck Israeli minefields. The Israeli forces did not have adequate optical equipment for night fighting, and had to gauge the position of the Syrian forces by their noise and artillery flares. Nafshi's battalion kept changing positions to avoid tank hunters. The fortifications were under heavy attack by tanks and infantry and were calling for help. Nafshi told them to go underground and provided them with supporting artillery fire. Abrash committed his division's 78th Armored Brigade in the northern sector at 2200 hours. He was behind schedule, but expected to make up for it if the 78th Brigade could reach and secure the Cunetra Massad Road, four and a half kilometers west of its starting line. It was believed that achieving this mission would cause the Israeli defenses to collapse. Each of the 82nd Brigade's 95T55 tanks was equipped with a specially designed infrared night scope. The night was brightly moonlit. The 82nd Brigade moved up the valley just two and a half kilometers from the Cunetra Masada Road. Bengal used his artillery for illumination, and ordered his men to remain silent until the Syrians were well within range. By 2200 hours, the Syrian tanks were within 800 meters of the Israeli positions. Both sides lost tanks to the terrain. Captain Yair Sweat, a 77th Battalion Company commander, was ordered to move to Booster and lost two tanks as a result. One crew managed to extricate its tank and use it to pull the other, but the delay distracted the battalion. Lieutenant Colonel Yosef Eldar, Commander of the 75th Armored Infantry Battalion and responsible for the area penetrated by the 78th Brigade, was wounded, and Ben Gal ordered Kahalani to assume responsibility. At this point, Kahalani's companies were scattered across 17 kilometers between Hermonet and Bunker 109. One Syrian tank was discovered only after Kahalani ordered one of the companies to turn off their lights. A Syrian anti-tank unit tried to advance down the Blot Yarkov Road, in front of Bunker 107, not knowing it was occupied. The Israelis opened fire and after a brief battle the Syrians retreated. The 78th Brigade and its supporting units hunkered down. Some may surmise this was due to the swift reaction time of the Israeli crews compared to the Syrian tank crews. 
As the Israelis were often firing at least two or more shells to the Syrians' one, this would prove a major factor in offsetting the disparity of the forces. Chapter 3 Section 2 Second Day On the dawn of the 7th of October, the area between Hermonit and Booster was named Valley of Tears because of the great number of burning tanks lying across it. At 7 o'clock, IAF Skyhawks began flying over the southern Golan. The first four came down from the southwest and within seconds, they were hit by Syrian SAMs. Several minutes later, another foursome approached and two were shot down. At 8 o'clock, the 78th Tank Brigade of the 7th Division launched a second attack. It advanced along a four-kilometer wide front in the valley in the direction of Wasit. The 75th Battalion was fighting a Syrian brigade, at ranges varying from 9 to 2,100 meters. Meanwhile, the 74th Battalion in the north was attacked by two Syrian battalions, supported by an armored infantry force in APCs, most of which were destroyed. The Syrian objective in this attack was a wadi running in the direction of Wasit along the base of Hermonit. Shaham was killed just before 1300 hours, a short time before the Syrians withdrew. The 77th Battalion was moved from south of Cuneatra to the central sector at Hermonit. Kahalani was ordered to leave a small force to the south to protect the brigade flank. The 74th Battalion, having lost about 10 tanks, remained in the north. The company Kahalani left behind was attacked in the afternoon, but the attacking Syrian force of about 20 tanks was destroyed. The 7th Brigade lost three company commanders in the morning fighting, and over a dozen tanks were damaged or destroyed, none of which were replaced. Late in the day, Ben Gal met with Kahalani and Eldar, who was wounded, on the southern slope of Booster to review the events. Meanwhile, Kahalani's deputy, Major Aiton Corley, supported the forces fighting in that sector. With troops from the 75th Battalion, he began rearming, refueling, and salvaging tanks and APCs. Three centurions at a time were withdrawn from the front-line positions and worked over at Wasit. This gave the crewmen a chance to eat, drink, and rest and improved the brigade's morale. The Syrians attacked the central sector again at 2200 hours with artillery. The 7th Division was joined by the 64th and 66th Field Artillery Regiments with the 81st Brigade, led by T-62 tanks, which were turned over from the general headquarters to allow a brash to mount a new offensive around the taplin wasit crossroads in the north-central Golan. The 81st Brigade arrived five hours after it was ordered out of the Kizur, Syria military base. With 400 artillery pieces, the 85th Infantry Brigade was to commit a company each of tanks and infantry to its divisional northern sector. The 78th and 81st Brigades were to commit over a hundred infantry-supported tanks in the divisional central sector, and the 121st Mechanized Brigade was to press some of its assault on Cuneatra with the help of BRDM-mounted Saga anti-tank missiles. All units were to be equipped with anti-tank weapons, mostly rocket-propelled grenades. In total, about 500 tanks were to attack at 22 colon 00. Nafshi's force of five tanks at Bunker 107 was the first to report the new Syrian attack. Given the small size of his force, Nafshi's position was vulnerable when faced with this heavy attack, and his tank's turret was damaged. He decided to allow the T-62s to close in on his position in order to reduce the Syrian advantages of numbers and night vision. Close to 2200 hours, the Syrians approached within 450 meters of the bunker. He hit two tanks and whispered commands through his microphone. After four minutes, 25 Syrian tanks were destroyed and their attack disturbed. Nafshi's force suffered no casualties. Most of the Syrian artillery fire fell on the Israeli units in the north. Kahalani warned his men to remain on the lookout for anti-tank squads. The Israeli brigade with fewer than 40 tanks, was facing approximately 500 Syrian tanks. Due to the Israelis' lack of night fighting equipment, the Syrians reached within close range, and a battle commenced at ranges of 27 to 55 meters. 
The Syrian tanks and commandos bypassed the Israelis and destroyed many tanks with RPGs. At one o'clock, the Syrians retreated, trying to evacuate damaged tanks and wounded. Bengal struck the area with artillery, and used the interval to refuel and reload. At four o'clock, the Syrians renewed their attacks. This time, they attacked mainly with artillery, and did not renew any major tank assaults. Only in the 7th Brigade's southern sector, the 7th Syrian Division 121st Mechanized Brigade was able to hold on. At dawn, 130 Syrian tanks and many APCs were lying in the valley, many of them behind or between the Israeli positions. During the night, two Syrian infantry battalions attacked the position on Hermonit and were fought off by fewer than 20 Israeli infantry troops from the Galani Brigade. Dozens of bodies were left lying on the battlefield. Chapter 3 Section 3, Third Day On the 8th of October, the Israeli 7th Brigade fought against elements of the Syrian 7th Division, the 3rd Armored Division and independent units, including the Republican Guard. On the brigade's southern flank, Zamis Company fought an armored force that had entered the area during the night. Zamis force of seven tanks held the attack and eliminated about 30 Syrian tanks, two APC companies and 20 vehicles. In the afternoon, three individual Syrian tank battalion concentrations with armored infantry tried to break through in the Hermonit area. The Syrian artillery identified the Israeli positions and inflicted most of its casualties. The 7th Brigade lost about 50 dead and many wounded, and were left with fewer than 45 working tanks. Bengal decided to create a reserve of five tanks under the command of his operations officer, whom he ordered to move back about half a kilometer away and prepare to block a Syrian breakthrough. At dusk, Abrash's tank was hit just as he was getting it ready for a new attack, and he was killed. At night, the Syrians attacked the central sector towards Booster. Bengal ordered Zamis' company to counterattack from the flank and the rear of the enemy. Zamis' seven tanks managed to break the attack. Chapter 3 Section 4, Fourth Day The Israeli Northern Command was trying to put together a command reserve, but could only assemble the survivors of the 53rd Battalion. The Barak Brigade had almost ceased to exist, its commander and key staff officers were dead, and almost all of its troops and equipment were absorbed into other brigades. Lieutenant Colonel Yossi Ben Hanan arrived the night before to take command of what was left of it. He had been the commander of the 53rd Battalion until two weeks earlier, and was on his honeymoon when the war started. He was sent to reorganize the brigade. He teamed with Erez, who had escaped from Tel Faris on Monday morning, and Shemuel Askarov, the 53rd Battalion's deputy commander, to start repairing tanks. At 1800 hours, he reported to his division commander, General Raphael Ayton that he was ready to bring forward the 13 centurions he had repaired thus far, and was ordered to head for Nafuk. He was on his way when the IF confirmed that about 100 Syrian tanks were headed toward the 7th Brigade's sector. One air photo depicted a complete Syrian battalion of 38 T-62s and 4 BMP apostrophes. At dawn on 9 October, the Syrians launched the heaviest artillery barrage thus far, using Katusha rockets and MiG-17s. Seven Syrian helicopters flew over the Israeli positions to Bukata, where four of them discharged commando forces. At 8 o'clock, a Syrian force of 100 tanks and a large number of APCs began to advance. The Israelis opened fire at maximum range but the Syrian advance continued. The Israeli commanders were exposed in their turrets and the artillery caused the number of casualties among them to grow significantly. Bengal ordered his force to leave the high ramps and withdraw some 360 meters to escape the artillery concentrations. Nafshi was ordered to join the 7th Brigade's area. He entered the battle with six tanks and was hit. He joined another tank and left A3. He ordered all the men under cover and requested Israeli artillery shelling of the position for protection. Later that day, he organized a supply convoy to A3. His tank was hit by a Syrian bazooka near Cunetra, 
and the tank behind him reported him dead. Nafshi continued with three APCs past Booster and entered A3 with the supplies. When the Israeli 7th Brigade withdrew from the hill, the artillery stopped and Syrian tanks mounted the hill to fire at them. Bengal's 7th Battalion had only six tanks and was acting as a brigade reserve, Nafshi had six tanks, and the operations officer was patrolling Bukata for the commandos. Zamir was fighting on Tel Git, and was running out of ammunition, so he asked for permission to withdraw and reload. Ben Gal refused at first, but relented when he was told there was only one shell per tank. Ben Gal consulted Aiton and decided to counterattack. The 7th Battalion began to move up the hill and saw the Syrian tanks. Kahalani called the other Israeli tanks behind the ramp and got little response, since they were from different units and were operating on different frequencies. The brigade communications officer cut into every company's net, but they still did not respond to Kahalani. Kahalani's gunner knocked out the Syrian tank at the top of the hill, and another one was hit by an Israeli tank from the rear of the ramp. In the north, the 74th Battalion was fighting with fewer than half its tanks. Bengal feared that it might not be able to hold out, and ordered it to leave three tanks in the sector and move to the northern flank of the battle to face the Assad Republican Guard, which was trying to use the dead ground to move towards El Rom. The battalion commander was killed in this battle. Bengal ordered the 77th Battalion to take command of the 74th Battalion. The 77th Battalion then fought two battalions of T-62 tanks that got by the 7th Brigade and were about 460 meters behind it. The 77th Battalion moved, to the high ground around the valley, and destroyed the Assad Republican Guard force. All the forces in the central sector, down to only about 15 tanks, were at this point under Kahalani's command, fighting at ranges of 230 to 460 meters from their original positions on the ramps. The Syrians passed them and fired on them from behind. The 7th Brigade was fighting in all directions. Tanks from both sides got mixed up with the other side and struck by both sides' artillery fire. Several Syrian Mi-8 helicopters flew over the valley toward El Rom. At this point, Aiton heard that Syrian infantry was approaching Bukata, north of El Rom. If the 7th Division were to break through, it could join the infantry force and proceed to Dan and Kiryat Shimona, inside Israel. Ben Gal described the battle to Aiton and told him he was not sure he could hold on. Aiton asked him to hold on for another half hour. At this point, the remaining 11 tanks of the Barak Brigade arrived, and Aiton directed them to Ben Gal. Aiton told Ben Gal of Ben Hanan's force. Kahalani called Captain Emmy Pallant, the senior officer behind the ramps, to use a signal flag to get the tank commander's attention and direct them to the ramp, but waving the flag got no response. Pallant fired his machine gun at the side of the nearest tank to get the commander to look out, and the message was passed. He ran from tank to tank and rapped on their turrets to get their attention before returning to his own tank and starting to move forward. No tank followed. Kahalani heard a sergeant from the 74th Battalion and ordered him to take his position and guard the wadi. The sergeant replied he did not have any shells left. Zamir, who was flanking his position to the south, reported a massive Syrian attack and asked for permission to move the remaining tanks to Zamir's company to a better position slightly to the south. Ben Gal refused. Kahalani reported that he was unable to control the tanks, which kept drifting to the rear. Ben Gal said he would try to get him more tanks. Kahalani ordered the sergeant to take his place, saying the Syrians would not try to attack if they saw his tank. Kahalani moved towards the tanks behind the rampart and told their commanders to raise their flags if they heard him. He saw ten tanks, and most raised their flags. Two IF planes accidentally bombed them, but none of the tanks were hit. On the southern sector, Zamir reported that he was out of ammunition and could no longer hold out on booster. His force was left with two shells per tank. He radioed Ben Gal that he could no longer hold on. Ben Gal asked him for ten more minutes. 
Zami's tank ran out of shells, and he began to fill his pockets with grenades and withdraw. Kahalani reached the tanks behind the ramps and told them they were going to retake the ramp. He started moving and a few other tanks slowly followed. Two Syrian tanks were knocked out, but the tanks behind him began to pull back. Ben Gal informed him on the radio that several tanks, under the command of Eli Jeeva, were on their way. Kahalani managed to convince the other tanks to follow him. The tank next to him hit a Syrian tank that came over the ramp. The tank's hatches were open, and eventually they could see the valley. Syrian tanks were moving forward, 50 to 910 meters away. The Israeli tanks opened fire. Kahalani ordered them to shoot only at moving tanks. Jiva's force reached the ramp and joined the battle. The Syrians fired a heavy artillery barrage. When it subsided, Kahalani could see no Syrian tanks moving ahead. Zamir had two tanks left and requested permission to withdraw, but Ben Gal turned him down. He began to withdraw just as a force from the south, under the command of Ben Hanan, was arriving. Askarov took a position near Ben Hanan, and the rest of the unit formed a battle line. Ben Hanan's face was wounded and he passed command to Askarov to get treatment. The force then destroyed about 30 Syrian tanks. The Israeli 7th Brigade was left with seven tanks, and Ben Gal told Aiton he could no longer hold on. Suddenly A3, surrounded by Syrian forces, reported that the Syrian supply trains were turning around and withdrawing. Denny Agman, Aiton's intelligence officer, told him that the Syrian general staff had decided to retreat. The Syrian forces, having lost over 500 tanks and APCs, began to withdraw. Chapter 4, Aftermath the Israeli 7th Brigade, including reinforcements, totals some 20 tanks. It began to pursue the Syrians but stopped at the anti-tank ditch. About 260 tanks were lying in the valley. The Syrians lost over 500 tanks and APCs and the Israelis lost 60 to 80 armored vehicles. One brigade from the 7th Division was taken out of action for three days and then reorganized as a battalion. Aiton told the 7th Brigade over the radio, you have saved the people of Israel. Ben Gal told Kahalani, you are the true savior of the people of Israel. In the afternoon, the brigade's tanks pulled back a few at a time for ammunition and fuel. Ben Gal told Kahalani that the brigade has been ordered to counterattack into Syria. Aiton asked him to attack the next day, so as not to allow the Syrians time to reorganize, but Ben Gal asked for a day to allow his men to rest and refill the ranks. Kahalani was later awarded the Medal of Valor for his performance in the battle. Decades after the battle, analysts were still presenting differing reasons for the Syrian withdrawal. In 1990, Patrick Seal argued that the reason why the Syrians were stopped was the superiority of the IAF, which was free to devote all of its attention to the Syrian front. In 2002, Kenneth Pollock wrote that the Syrian forces did not look for an alternative axis of advance and rolled forward without defending their flanks. In 1998, Martin van Krefeld suggested the explanation that on October 8, when Israel felt that the battle was being lost, it threatened Syria with a nuclear strike. 